Okay. Got a small group today. Um, so last time we were, we were talking about compensation and uh, we were talking about um, negligence and we were talking about the, the deal is that if you um, had no liability, then the um, person that might be injured takes sufficient precaution. And if you have um, strict liability, then the person that might cause the injury would take precaution. But you got a problem, you can't, how do you get them both to do that? And then we looked at negligence rules. And it turns out that because, now why does negligence work? Because you get a sudden drop if you meet the standard, if you somehow know what the optimal amount of precaution was. If you knew what that was, then if you hit that standard, you, the, you know, it's set by your uh, legal structure or administrative rule or whatever. If you, if you meet that standard, boom, you, if you're the potential injurer, boom, all of a sudden you drop to no liability. And so you, as the potential victim, know that the injurer is going to do that. And so, so you're seeing it as no liability. Uh, and if you're on the other side, you know that if the, um, if the uh, potential injurer, excuse me, the, the potential injury, I guess we'd call it victim, um, the potential victim knows that if they meet the standard, then there's strict liability, so you know you're gonna, they're gonna do that. And so what do you do? Everybody knows that the other person has this big drop at meeting when they meet the standard, so you know the other person's gonna meet the standard. So the, for the potential victim, they are seeing it as there's gonna be no liability, and the potential injurer is seeing it that there's gonna be strict liability, and so you end up with, that's why the negligence rule uh, works. Now, of course, it's like anything else, um, you know, how do you know what the, the proper precaution is, right? I mean, if you're setting the standard to make it, you don't really know what that is. But again, it's not a matter of giving you the exact right answer. It's the matter of, okay, where should we be headed when we're making the law, okay? Um, and then um, we talked a little bit about that if there was an all or nothing thing where you can, you can either, um, we we're talking about the pilot light on my, um, my, my uh, uh, fireplace. Um, if you could either have it so that, you know, I gotta shut the pilot light off if there's a gas leak, uh, or we could have it automatically shut off. Uh, and so when it's an all or nothing, or, or you know, zero one decision, uh, then, um, you'd find the party that's most able to figure out what to do uh, or be able to respond to whatever the problem is and, and then they'll, they'll do it, okay? So, um, so that leads us to the, what about if you have something where you have activity levels that, you know, how often you drive your car, right? So. Oops. So, you know, if you drive your car 150,000 miles a year, okay, then any particular time that you're out driving, there's going to be some probability that you're going to cause an accident, but you're doing it a lot, right? And you could reduce the chance of an accident if you didn't drive so much. Um, so the question is, how do you look at a... Um, uh, a, a probability of harm when the activity, when you have greater amounts of activity, how do you get people to, um, to figure out what the proper precaution is? Maybe I should reduce the amount of driving that I do or reduce the amount of flying that I do or whatever. So again, um, if you had a negligence rule, 
if you just had a negligence rule, um, and then, then and what you say is you can drive as often as you want as long as you take the precaution at that particular time, right? So you can, basically in this case, you can, well, we're using drive as the, as the activity as often as you want. But you take the uh, efficient precaution for each drive, right? You drive the speed limit every time or whatever. Um, what's the problem? It's that if, that, if the, the, the potential injurer isn't going to take into account the increase in the probability of an accident if you drive 100,000 miles versus if you don't drive at all, right? Or you drive, you know, you know, around here, you, you could easily drive like 15 miles a week, right? Um, and so the probability of you're having an accident, you're crashing into somebody, if you're driving 15 miles a week is different than somebody that is um, a, a traveling salesperson and they're out there driving every day, right? So if this is the case, um, the, right, you, you won't take proper precaution say with well, efficient precaution, we'll say you won't take efficient precaution with regard to how often you do the thing. All right. To the amount of the activity. Right. Now if you have a strict liability, okay, so if we have a strict liability, Then what will happen is you will take that into account, right? You'll take the activity level into account, right? You'll take efficient precaution. So you say, you know what? If I'm driving 100,000 miles, uh, you know, a year, I got more chance of an accident than if I'm driving 100 miles a year. So when you're deciding how many miles you're going to drive, you'll take into account the fact that the more you drive, then the, the greater the probability of the accident, given that every time you drive, right, you're taking proper precaution every time you drive. Well, um, what's, what's, what's the, uh, the uh, what you need to do here is choose the party whose activity most affects the accident and have them bear, the, bear a strict liability, okay? So you find the party from an activity level, you're gonna find the party whose activity level most affects the accidents and assign strict liability. So in this particular case, you'd have the person that is driving the most uh, versus the person that's crossing the street the most or whatever, uh, then they, and you signed a, a strict liability to them. What's the problem here? The problem is I've got, I can't do efficient precaution which says negligence, and strict liability to the person that's activity affects it the most, right? So, so the, the problem is you can't get the perfect solution, right? And so you have to sort of figure out which is more important, right? You have to figure out which is more important. So that, you know, the problem is um, I can't have strict liability to deal with the activity level and and have negligence to deal with the precaution for each accident or for each action. Okay, that's a problem, right? Can't can't solve both. Can't have both at the same time. So again, you have to figure out okay which 
which is the bigger problem? Which, which is the greater chance or has the, the greatest expected loss, right? You gotta figure out the probability times the loss. If your activity level doesn't change the probability very much, then I don't gotta worry about it, right? If the, if the activity level has a big effect on the probability of an accident, or it has a big effect on, it's hard to think, why it would have a big effect on the, on the, uh, on the amount of the loss. And it's more likely to, does it have a big effect on the, on the uh, uh, probability? M well, maybe not. Maybe if you're a really safe driver, if you drive 100,000 miles, it doesn't change very much if you're driving only 50 miles, right? Um, so, so you have to sort of, uh, again, use your intuition, but what's, what this is doing about is giving you guidance on what the law ought to look like, okay? So if the activity level is, uh, affects the outcome, uh, uh, excuse me, affects the probability, then I want to assign it, yeah? Could you explain again why negligence doesn't result in efficient why, why, why negligence doesn't? Because if it's, if, if it's negligence on, for any one activity, right? So each time you drive, you are satisfying the negligence, okay? So each time you drive, you are being, you know, you're satisfying the precaution for that particular drive, okay? But if that's the way it works, then your activity level doesn't affect what, the, what, what your damages are. So if my activity level, if the, if the, if the deal is simple negligence, that's what I mean by neg what I mean by negligence in that in this sense. On each individual activity, am I each time that I do it, am I hitting the proper precaution each time I do it? If that's the rule, then my my um, the compensation that I would have to do, or that the, or what I would be uh, declared that I was responsible for the accident is independent of how often that I drive, okay? So as long as you're a safe, safe driver discount, right? State Farm or whoever it is. Um, as, lo as long as you're a safe driver, right? I'd say, okay, drive 100,000 miles or drive 20 miles, it's the same, okay? So if, again, if it is an activity that doesn't affect very much the probability of an accident if, if, it, if whatever you're doing, each time you do it, it doesn't, you know, the additional activity level doesn't affect the probability of an accident, then you don't have to worry about it, right? You can just do negligence. If you got something where the amount of times that you dive into the pool or something, could, or, or the amount of times that you skydive, okay, that may, each time you skydived, you were, you know, efficient or whatever, uh, but the amount of times that you do it affects the probability that there's going to be an accident. So you just got to make that trade-off, right? Things where the amount of times you do it has a big effect on the probability of an injury, then you want to go to the strict liability. But if you have a, if you have something where the, 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 the increase in probability is from efficiency on, on any particular time that you do it, then you stick with negligence. Does that make, make sense? Okay. So again, it's just a matter of, of trade-offs and, and looking at, okay, I can't solve both problems at the same time, so I got to figure out which one I want to, which one has a higher probability of causing the accident, and deal with and deal with it that way. Um, all right. So then the question just become, or another question. Again, we're doing, you know, going through topics of the of the uh, tort law. Um, another topic is how do you set the standard, right? of precaution, right? So we're if we're talking about negligence, we're saying, okay, um, no liability if you meet the efficient level of precaution, 
right, on whoever it is. And the question then becomes, how do you figure out what X star is? How do you, how do you figure out what the efficient level of precaution is? Okay. So there's a thing called the hand rule after a gentleman named Hand. And basically the, the, the uh, um, hand rule says, uh, the, guy, the guy's name was Learned Hand, sort of interesting first name. Can you imagine naming your kid Learned, right? Everybody, you know, your professor would think, oh, they must get an A in every class, they're learned. But anyway, um, anyway, uh, he said, well, how do, how do you do that? Did the, and, and so what, what do you have to do? You have to look at the marginal social benefit of the precaution versus the marginal social cost, right? So you got the marginal, just like anything, marginal social benefit versus the marginal social cost, right? So this was the, you know, the W on the WX uh, on the marginal social cost, and then you had P prime of X times A uh, was the marginal social benefit, and so you want to make them equal to one another if you're going to maximize the difference between the two. Um, so uh, one is you could do it case by case. You could have right. What you have is the judge decides, right? The judge uh, hears expert witnesses. And you have all sorts of suits going on, and uh, eventually, you say, okay, we've had 15 court cases on this stuff. The expert witnesses have all said that, you know, 55 miles an hour is the efficient level of precaution, uh, and so what do we do? If, then, then the judge is deciding case by case, um, and so you get this consolidation of the expert witnesses, what will happen? Then you'll either legislate it, right? You could say, okay, we're gonna pass a law that says you have to obey the speed limit, right? And we're going to just, and, and here's what the speed limit is from uh, point A uh, to point B. Or you could have uh, an administrative rule. Right? You can have an executive order. The last couple of presidents have had executive orders on a bunch of things, right? So you could have an executive order, or basically either the executive branch or the legislative branch are gonna say, okay, here, here's what it is. We're gonna set a, we're gonna set a legal standard that, that this is what it is. Um, or you could say best practices. Okay, we're not gonna decide what the, what the, if the, proper way of designing a chainsaw is, okay, you could have you could have made a chainsaw that goofs up and when I'm using it, you know, I don't know if you know Rich Bogenberg, but he's an expert with a chainsaw, right? He's got his chainsaw and he's come, came over and cut down one of my trees and a couple of my little trees and Cut them all up. Anyway, he uses his chainsaw. So he's, he's really good at, uh, at the chainsaw. But what happens if the people that make the chainsaw goofed up when they made the chainsaw so that the chain comes flying off and, uh, you know, cuts his arm off or something, okay? So one way you could do it is best practices, which is really an industry standard. Oops. So there may be some sort of industry standard that everybody agrees to, right? Everybody in the chainsaw manufacturing sector makes this, this chainsaw this way. There's an industry and you say, okay, that's good, that's good, right? If, you, if what you do is um, you make the chainsaw the way everybody else is making the chainsaw, then, you know, with, with uh, uh, you know, the proper uh, safety measures on, you know, whether the 
what would happen if the chain broke or something like that, right? The, the thing turns off or whatever. Uh, then you have an you could have an industry standard that would do it. And so um, if you and so basically what would happen is you'd say um, if the industry uh, if this if your machine or whatever your consumer product is that you're producing if it met the industry standard then you're okay. We're not going to try to figure out what the optimal way of, or the efficient way of making, uh, uh, making ladders is, okay? If, you, if your ladder is, beats the, the industry standard, then we're just gonna accept the industry standard as a way of doing it. So you have some things that have that characteristic, and you have some things where the, you have a, an administrative rule or you have a piece of legislation that says you have to do it this way. Notice that if you were doing consumer product, you probably don't want to have all sorts of laws about every consumer product there is out there, right? You're, gonna, you're more likely to say, hey, if, if, if you know, with the way you built this, this item, this consumer product, the way you built it looks a lot like what everybody else was doing, we're gonna say it's, it's okay. Right, so uh, there's always a you know an information cost out there. How, how do I figure out what it is, and do I want to have a piece of legislation for every particular consumer good out there? You're not going to have that, right? So generally, it's in minute you meet the minute uh, the the industry standard in terms of uh, consumer product. Um, now. It's, inter it, it, it's also interesting just to think slightly about what happens in, the, in, uh, in setting the standard. Uh, ignore the precaution uh, to be taken by the injurer uh, for their expected loss. So again, I, the chainsaw manufacturer, my expected loss from the chainsaw breaking and you getting injured is zero, right? So again, you can see why, uh, why certain things would have a, uh, you'd want the potential, if, if, potential injurer to take into account the fact that they might get injured too, right? So when, when you are, uh, like when you're driving, right, you should take into account the fact that if you crash into somebody, you're gonna cause an injury to the person that you crashed into, but you're also gonna cause an injury to yourself, right? So we hadn't really been talking about that much, but that's just another thing to be, to be thinking about when we're looking at, again, um, in the topics of tort law, uh, just and a side thing to be, to be thinking about. All right, so then let's just go through some of the difficulties in applying all this stuff, or not stuff, applying uh, the theory. So if we just look at difficulties in application. Well, the first thing to think about is um, when you're going to, if you have a lawsuit, do you not only, if you have negligence, okay, right? Negligence solves this problem about having the, the um, potential injurer and the potential victim setting the proper amount of precaution, but when you actually have, that, have the court case, you have the litigation cost, right? That's one of the things that you gotta think about is you got this litigation cost. And if you sort of think about that, if we look at litigation cost, it's harder to show negligence than who caused the accident. 
right? If I'm thinking about, uh, thinking about having a suit, I, if, if we have a negligence rule, I got to not only show that you caused the accident, but you also were negligent. You also didn't, you know, you were, you were driving too fast, okay? So how do I do that, right? How, how do I, you know, just imagine you're in a car accident and somebody crashes into you. Do you know if they were going 62 or whether they were going 55 and, you know, they're on US 12 where the, it's a 55 speed limit? Hard for, you to, hard for you to do that, right? Whereas you might be able to more easily show that, hey, they crashed into me, okay? So there's, you know, there's this total cost of that, when you look at the total cost of, uh, of uh, a suit, you're raising the cost of figuring out what the outcome ought to be. You, and so when you go to hire an attorney, your attorney's gonna have to show not only did the other person cause the accident, but they were negligent when they did, as opposed to just showing that they uh, caused the accident. Um, a second thing is, how do you figure out what the compensation was, All right? Figure out the harm. Right, the value of the harm. Again, um, we were when we were, you know, talking about it on the midterm. Um, if you have perfect compensation, if that's the rule, right, it's a forced sale. I, if I value uh, the right, I don't have the right, but if I value it more than you do, um, and you get perfect compensation then what, what can I do? I can violate the right, compensate you, you're on the same utility level, I'm higher, and it works. But if I set the compensation wrong, then what will happen if I set the compensation too high, then what will happen is I valued it more than you, but that transformation doesn't happen, right? If I set it too low, you value it more than I do, but I go ahead and take the right and I just compensate you. So that's, that, that, of course, is a problem. Um, and notice that it will, um, basically, it'll move in the same direction, that if you set too high, if I, if, I, if I set the value too high, then what will happen is I'll take the potential uh, injurer will take too much precaution, right? for the uh, potential injurer. And of course the opposite, you know, too low, not enough. So in a, in a sense, it'll, it'll, um, it'll move in the same direction, right? And, and, and that's if we have strict liability, right? So under strict liability, what will happen is I'll overestimate my, I mean, in, 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 in both cases, um, the, um, if I do either when we talked about compensation or if we talk about strict liability, right? If the liability is all on me, so either we have the, the compensation issue that we talked about on the midterm or we can talk about strict liability and under strict liability, you get the same thing. That is, I'll take too much precaution if I set the harm too high, right? Because I got to figure out what's the loss to me as the person who does the injuring, right? If I, so if I set it too high, I got strict liability, and what's going to happen is I am the injurer. I'm going to take on too much precaution. If I set it too low, I'm not going to take enough precaution. So whether you do compensation or strict liability, you get, you, you don't necessarily get the right answer, right? Um, if you have some sort of consistent, if you have a consistent error
in deciding who caused the accident. Well, then you'll get what you might expect, right? I'm going to take less precaution if you consistently, I'm the potential injurer, right? I'm going to take less precaution. So the injurer will, will take less precaution. And again, this, this, this is not rocket surgery here, right? Um, if, if, there, if you consistently make it so that they'll take less precaution, if you consistently under, if you consistently mistake uh, who caused on this, the, um, what we might call the downside or um, uh, who caused on the uh, uh, side of the injurer. So you consistently guess wrong about my causing the accident, okay? If that's, if I'm, if I'm consistently wrong in saying, hey, the person actually caused the accident, but I consistently, I uh, consistently underestimate who caused it, the potential injurer is going to take less precaution. If I make it, if I consistently make it so I overestimate who caused the accident, I, I think you caused the accident more often than you actually did, if you consistently do that, well, what will happen, right? You'll take more precaution, right? You'll take, you'll take an, uh, you'll over, uh, have over precaution if you, if you consistently estimate in the other direction, right? So you'd have, um, uh, you'll take, uh, you'll take more precaution if you uh, uh, consistently um, uh, overestimate, think about overestimate who caused the precaution, okay, or who caused the accident, okay. Um, then um, another thing is, just as a commentary, and it's not really, in fact, it's not a problem in a sense that. If we're looking at a if we're looking at a, a negligence rule, small errors and damages. If I have a negligence rule, then what happens? Small errors and damages. Will not have much effect. And why is that? It's because there's this sudden drop, right? There's this sudden drop in uh, the um, damages you have to pay. Well, not the damage you have to pay, but in the total. Well, there's a sudden drop in the, oh, this way. There's a sudden drop in the total cost. So that, remember when we're, we're looking at why you expect that under a, um, why you'd expect under a, a negligence rule that the other party is always going to take efficient precaution because all of a sudden it goes from strict liability to no liability on the person that is the potential injurer and it goes from it goes from uh, uh, strict liability to no liability for the person. If you if you if you are the potential victim, it goes from no liability to strict liability. So all of a sudden, there's a big drop in their total cost. And so, if I get the damages wrong by a little bit, then it's probably not going to affect whether you take the efficient precaution or not, right? If I know what X star is, if there's a $15,000 drop in what you have to pay if you take efficient precaution on, on either side, either as the potential victim or the potential injurer, then if there's a $15,000 drop, maybe I get the damages wrong by $5,000, right? You'll still end up with the same, the same result. Thing. So, if you, under a negligence rule, it, uh, you don't have to get the damages 
um, the, the uh, damage is exactly correct, you can have a little bit of leeway, in, a little, little bit of leeway in doing that. Um, if you have randomness in the amount of damages, right? so sometimes you get it too high, sometimes you get it too low, right? If you have randomness in estimating damages, then what will happen? There won't, there'll be no effect, right? Because sometimes, so the, the times that it's overestimated will be offset by the times that it's underestimated, okay? So if there's just sort of randomness out there, um, you're, it doesn't have a consistent underestimation or a consistent overestimation, right? That doesn't have a consistent over precaution or a consistent under precaution. If it's like, okay, there's, you know there's gonna be an error, so you're the potential injurer, and you know there's gonna be an error in the damages, but it might be too high, but it might be too low, you don't really know, then you'll, it, it shouldn't have an effect on the amount of, amount of precaution because on the, on the, the, uh, in a true randomness, the overestimations will be weight, uh, weighted by the underestimation, okay? So it's gotta be, in order for it to affect the amount of precaution, you've gotta have um, some consistency so you, so you know when you're the potential victim or the potential injurer, you know they're gonna overestimate or you know they're gonna underestimate. But if you, if you say, okay, there's a 50% chance they'll overestimate and a 50% chance they'll underestimate, then you're, it's not gonna affect, oh yeah, if, then I will always take more precaution or I'll always take less precaution. Um, if there's errors in the standard, right? If there's errors in the standard, then precaution will move in the same direction, right? Well, I'll just say move in a consistent direction in that. If you tend to, if you, you set the standard too low, what's gonna happen? If you set the standard too low, then there'll be less precaution than's efficient, right? If I if I set the the uh, the, uh, uh, the the standard um, the uh, well, let's let's think of it this way. How do I want to say this? Let me let me let, let me let me say it this way. If if what happens is I set the standard too low, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna undertake not enough precaution, right? If I set the standard at 50, if I set the standard at 25 miles an hour when it really should be 50 miles an hour, then your, uh, uh, see I'm not putting it this way very well, am I? Um, it, yeah, if, 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 I, if, I set the, if I set the standard, um, if, I set, if I have an error in the standard, then what will happen is I will have too much precaution. Let me just, let me just put it this way. Um, if I set the standard, just, just do it this way, I'll just set it straightforward, right? If I set the standard too low, then what will happen is there's gonna be less precaution than there should be, right? And if I set the standard too high, then there'll be more precaution. And what I mean by then, if, then is efficient. That's what I mean to say, okay? If I set this, and we've already talked about this, right? If I, if I set the standard too low, what will happen is you guys will meet the standard, right? 
but you're meeting the standard and the standard's too low. So you're not gonna take enough precaution. If what I do is I set the standard too high, then you guys are gonna meet the standard, right? Because there's gonna be this sudden drop in what your costs are gonna be, right? So you're gonna take more precaution than is efficient. So I gotta figure out what, the, what I gotta uh, set the, the, the standard at. Um, the, if we have a, um, there's a, just a definition here is that I could either pay compensation to the victim or I could pay a fine to the state, okay? So if, the, and if we have it where you, I could pay to the victim or to the government. And uh, it's caused that, uh, it's called private law if you pay to the victim Private law if you pay to the victim, or public law if you pay it to the government. Just terminology. So, you know, if you, you know, you might see it in an article or something, that's just terminology. But if you were to think about it, right, I could, I could, I could have you pay a fine if you, uh, if you do something. I could, I could do both, right? I could make it so that you're going beyond the speed limit and you crash into somebody, I could make it so that you have to compensate them, plus you have to pay a fine, okay? Or when we do, um, when we do criminal law, we could make it so, you know, if you have to go to jail for six weeks or something like that, right? So just the, the point is, is that um, you could either, you, you could do, I gotta pay a fine, and I gotta pay compensation, or I gotta pay compensation, or I gotta pay a fine, uh, so, so you could uh, move that around. Um, again, when we're thinking of the total cost of the thing, if you have no liability, I forget what number this is, but if you have no liability, then what happens is you, you don't have to figure out uh, the administrative cost, right? There's Okay. There's no administrative cost in the sense that I don't, uh, if, if there's no liability, then, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to figure out who caused the accident. We have, don't have to figure out what the harm was, right? And what do you have, there are 12 states in, uh, um, that have essentially that in, in, in no fault insurance is like that, right? And we'll talk a little bit more next time about insurance. But if you have no-fault insurance, why do you have that? You say, okay, I don't have to show, I don't, I'm, not, I'm gonna have fewer suits with no-fault insurance uh, because uh, I, don't, I don't have to prove who caused the accident. Uh, I don't have to prove the amount of harm, or et, uh, et cetera. So by, by, not, by not having to prove who caused the accident, I got, I don't, I don't have as much, administrative costs. So when you're figuring out the total cost of the suit, right, that was one of the things that you have to, you have to think about, how you're gonna administer the thing. Um, strict liability also reduces administrative costs. Because under, under strict liability, I don't have to show negligence on either party, right? It's just, eh, you caused the accident, that's it, okay? So I just have to prove, prove cause, and so under strict liability, then you're gonna have uh, um, uh, the uh, administrative costs will be, uh, uh, be lower. Um, now, if you have negligence, then it's gonna reduce the number of chances to, to, to sue, right? I don't, I don't have to 
I, I won't be suing over a, 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 a question of did you meet the standard or not. It's just strict liability, that's it. Okay. So again, um, just, that, that just to think about when you're making the law, just to think about these are potential problems in the sense. And just thinking about how um, when I'm, uh, you know, sort of, in a sense, what the trade-off is. Okay, uh, it it may be that um, you know, as, as we were saying with the the uh, uh, a negligence rule, right? A negligence rule will theoretically result in the proper amount of precaution on both sides, but then, okay, how do I, now I gotta show negligence, right, if I'm suing you. Whereas before, I just had to show you caused the accident, right? So it's just, it's just that there are trade-offs, uh, and, and again, it's not like there's a, a perfect answer, but it's to just give you direction on where you oughta, uh, where you oughta be going with the law, because what's, the whole deal is, I wanna make the law such that the um, that I've, I've put proper incentives in and I have to look at what's the cost of, of the overall effect of the law. Okay. Um, all right, well, just, what we're going to do for next time is we're going to look at consumer product injuries. Um, when we think about tort, what was tort law about? Tort law was mainly about if there's high transactions costs, and it's mainly about accidents, right? I can't bargain with you, hey, slow down a little bit, you know? Uh, so, the, so that's what tort law is about. When you have real, you know, you have high transactions costs, but what if you're buying a product? Uh, what, if, what if you're, uh, like, a, a basically consumer product injuries? When you have consumer product injuries, um, it's not a matter of high transactions costs when, and in the sense that you're, you're you know, buying the product. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna try to think through, okay, who, who should you put the, the um, who should you put the liability on in a sense? That is, is it, does a chainsaw manufacturer more likely to know the efficient amount of production in making the chainsaw? Because if they make it, so that it, if you're thinking about it, when you're buying a chainsaw, right, if they have to put in extra, you know, things to make it so that it's safer, the cost of the chainsaw is going to be more when you go to buy it, right? So you have to sort of think through, okay, is it easier for the chainsaw manufacturer to know what the amount of proper precaution is or or is it easier for you to know, you know, you're like this efficient consumer and know everything about chainsaws. Uh, and so you gotta think about who, who you're gonna assign it to. So generally, you have this industry standard in a sense that generally what will happen is that uh, you'll make the liability on the chainsaw manufacturer, right? Or if you've ever, like I said, if you ever buy a ladder, it'll, it'll tell you, you know, don't stand too high on the ladder, right? Um, so what we'll do is, well, it shouldn't take long to do that, and then, then, we'll, um, then we'll be moving on to uh, chapter seven, uh, which is, again, uh, more, more topics, like what happens if people aren't rational in the sense that they, from behavioral, how many have had behavioral economics? All right, so you, you know, in behavioral economics, you think, well, people like underestimate the, uh, the uh, probability that an event could happen, right? If they consistently do that, then that's gonna affect, because you want people to take proper precaution, if you gotta take that into account when you're deciding how you're gonna structure the law. If people are gonna uh, consistently underestimate the probability, then they're consistently not gonna take enough precaution, right? So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about in chapter seven. So go ahead and, and uh, go ahead and start looking through chapter seven uh, for Friday. <laughs>